Washington State University. Go Cougs! Now let's consider a second approach to activity discovery. In this one, instead of partitioning all of our data points into separate clusters, we're actually going to grow sequences of data points. The method for finding these sequences is to start by considering every data point as a candidate pattern of length one. In our case, the data points represent the feature vectors extracted from a window of sensor data. These windows could be overlapping or non overlapping. Once we have these initial candidates, then we go through these steps that repeat until we meet some kind of a stopping criteria. In this repeated process, for every candidate of length k, and k could be anywhere between 1 and the number of data points in the set, we evaluate the candidates based on their frequency. So if a candidate has sufficient frequency, then it remains in our list of viable patterns or candidates and we prune or remove all the candidates that have a frequency less than our threshold value. Once we've pruned the candidates that have insufficient frequency, then we can grow candidates of the next longer length, length k plus 1, by expanding all of those candidates that had sufficient frequency of length k. The nice thing about this particular algorithm is that it does rely on this a priori property or the downward closure property and this means that instead of going back to the original data set and considering all candidates of length k plus one which would be computationally a very lengthy process we can simply consider all of the candidates that were sufficiently frequent of length k and extend all of the instances that surround those occurrences of the pattern in order to find our candidates of length k plus 1, which requires much less computation time and effort. Our stopping criteria will be to not repeat this process if there are no new candidates that occur. So let's look at an example of this process. And in this example, we're letting every data point be represented by a circle and the value of that data point be represented by the color of the circle. So we will consider it with this pictorial example and then relate it to how it might look like with our sensor data. So if we have this sequence from left to right of colored circles and a minimum frequency of three, that means every pattern we find must have to occur at least three times within the sequence to be kept as a pattern candidate. Then we start with the initial set of candidates, which are of length one, meaning every individual data point. So there's all these different colored circles that are individual patterns, and this is the frequency of those data points within the sequence. So there are 10 greens, seven reds, five blues, six yellows, and only one of the other three colors. Given that our minimum frequency is three, we're going to prune or remove the bottom three candidates, keep the top four, and in fact extend them to try to find patterns of length k equals two. And the way we extend them is that we go back to the occurrences of these data points in the original data set and look at neighboring circles on either side of them. Every way that we can extend that pattern to the left or to the right becomes a new candidate. So in the case of the green dots, there are many ways that we can extend it to the left or to the right by looking at every occurrence of the green dot. Here, with the first green dot, we can only extend it to the right to make it a green-red pattern. But in this case, we can extend it to the left and make it a yellow-green, or to the right and make it a green-green. We do this for all of the occurrences of a green dot, as well as for all the occurrences of a red dot, blue dot, or yellow dot, and end up with these length two patterns. We've recorded them here with their frequency, so you can see, once again, we, we prune all of the patterns that have a frequency less than three.
for all of the occurrences that we do keep, we can extend them further in order to find patterns of length 3. With the green-red pattern, we can go to each one of the occurrences of green-red in the database and try to extend it one dot to the left or to the right. Again, here we cannot extend it to the left, but we can extend it to the right to make a pattern that is green, red, blue. In our next case of green, red over here, we can extend it to the left to make it a green, green, red, or extend it to the right to make it a green, red, blue, and so forth, ending up with this set of length three patterns and their corresponding frequencies. Note that we didn't have to go back to the original database and look for all length three patterns. We only need to start with the ones that are sufficiently frequent of the length two patterns and extend them by one in all possible directions. And that is that downward closure property, which essentially says that if a pattern of length two is not sufficiently frequent, there's no way that an extension of it is going to have greater frequency. So we don't need to look at extensions of the patterns that have been pruned, only those that are still viable candidates after the previous iteration. So once we found all candidates of length three, we see that we have two possibilities left. We extend them by one in all possible directions and get all these candidates of length four, none of which are sufficiently frequent. So now we have all possible patterns. Consider the fact that when we apply sequence discovery to our sensor data, a data point consists of a large feature vector extracted from a window of actual sensor events. So the likelihood that two feature vectors are going to match exactly is quite low. If we want to find sequence patterns, then we might want to allow a certain distance between data points to count it as a match when we compute the frequency of a particular pattern. We could then say that an instance is an occurrence of a pattern as long as the distance between the sequence instance and its pattern definition is sufficiently small. How are we going to define such a distance? Well, we could use our Manhattan distance that we employed for clustering. Recall that was the sum of the absolute values of all the differences of the features within the vector. So we can employ that. Another possibility that's very common is edit distance, in which we assign a cost to every manipulation of one sequence we apply in order to make it equal to the second. And that could be to reverse some of the values, or it could be to substitute one of the values with another, or whatever it takes to perform an operation to make one sequence equivalent to the other. In our example, then, of colored dots, we can see that while there were originally no patterns of length four that had sufficient frequency, once we employ this notion of distance, there might be one that would count. For example, with this pattern red, blue, yellow, green, there were only two instances that exactly match that pattern. But if we allow a distance of a quarter of the length of the pattern, then we see there's this occurrence red, blue, yellow, pink, in which there's only one difference between the pattern occurrence and its definition, which meets our distance threshold, which allows us to count this sequence as an instance of the pattern definition. By allowing such a notion of distance, we can now say that there are three occurrences of this pattern, red, blue, yellow, green, and can extend it further, actually finding a pattern of length five that has sufficient frequency to continue even farther. So both clustering and sequence discovery allow us to automatically find activity patterns that we can then use to analyze routines. We can also model them for activity recognition and prediction. When we apply these types of algorithms, such as the sequence discovery to actual smart home data, in addition to looking for occurrences of predefined activities, we typically find activities that are an important part of a person's day, but are just not those that are defined in the literature. In one home, for example, where ambient sensors were installed and we applied activity discovery to data that did not fall into a predefined activity category, 
we found patterns such as repeated movements back and forth between the kitchen and the dining room, perhaps to set the table, and that just did not happen to be one of the predefined activity categories. We also found a number of trips into the guest room that the, purpose, the resident used as a craft room. So that was an important part of their day. It was just not part of the predefined activity categories. Another very frequent pattern was a transition between activities, such as moving from the living room in the evening to the bedroom to start getting ready for bed. Something else we notice is that the most frequent sequences are ones that are quite short. A one home, for example, where ambient sensors were installed and we applied activity discovery to data that did not fall into a predefined activity category, we found patterns such as repeated movements back and forth between the kitchen and the dining room, perhaps to set the table, and that just did not happen to be one of the predefined activity categories. We also found a number of trips into the guest room that the, purpose, the resident used as a craft room. So that was an important part of their day. It was just not part of the predefined activity categories. Another very frequent pattern was a transition between activities, such as moving from the living room in the evening to the bedroom to start getting ready for bed. Something else we notice is that the most frequent sequences are ones that are quite short. So in addition to incorporating a distance threshold into, in order to allow a larger number of instances to be found for a particular sequence pattern, we can also introduce hierarchical sequence discovery. In hierarchical sequence discovery, we find frequent patterns, we compress the original data by replacing every occurrence of a pattern with just a new symbol indicating an occurrence of the pattern, and we repeat the discovery process. In this example, we can replace every occurrence of the red, blue, yellow pattern with just the symbol P. And then when we apply sequence discovery to this compressed set of symbols, we find a new pattern, which is a green dot followed by a P that occurs three times. If we continually repeat this process of discovery and compression, what happens is that our discovered patterns become longer and the discoveries themselves form a hierarchy in which discovered patterns consist of other discovered patterns at an earlier iteration. We can continue this process until no additional compression can be made from our discoveries, which means that we have discovered all repeating patterns that we can within the database and fully describe the data as a result.